Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are excited. We have a treat for you today. We are going to interview Judd Saul. He recently released his movie about six weeks ago, Enemies Within the Church. And during this conversation slash interview, we're going to get to hear a lot of the background and some of the things that you didn't get to see in the press. And we're hoping that Judd will release those things to us. So Judd, thank you so much for joining us this evening. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for having me. We are excited. You know, um, I think the first thing to just kind of lay some things out, as you know, I'm sure you know, producing that movie and then having it released, that there was going to be some heat, some backlash from that. So kind of share with us, you know, what you thought pre-release and then what's actually kind of been the response after. Um, pre -re whenever you do a film, especially something as controversial as this, where you know you're really not just poking the bear, but you're kind of whacking it with a baseball bat, um, you don't quite know what's going to happen when you put it out because we've been living and breathing the story. We started production about three years ago. So we've been living and breathing the information being, you know, kind of being uh, saturated with the content of the movie. So when you put it out for the first time, um, we know we're going to get blowback. We don't quite know how the audience is going to respond to it because mm -hmm. uh, it is such a heavy film. It is a very heavy film. And, um, I would say since the release, we've been pleasantly surprised uh, at the overwhelming positive response we've gotten from a lot of people. And um, I say that that's really made this uh, uh, rewarding and um, it, it's, it's been quite an experience. Wow. Kevin, Neil, anyone want to jump in? or Because I can hog it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my question is, is what was the impetus? Why? So what did you see uh, either within the church or around the church or around church activities or and, and working with clergy or whatever that that sort of led you to believe that you needed to do this type of uh, production? I mean, what was it that really uh, led you um, to believe that, you know, we really need to do a, some kind of a documentary on what's happening? Well, I, uh, um, I had just come off of doing the film with uh, Trevor Loudon, Loudon, Enemies Within, where we were going after congressmen and senators, their ties to the Communist Party, and uh, congressmen and senators' ties to Muslim Brotherhood front groups. Uh, so, I, and I, I, we spent about two and a half years on that documentary, so I was pretty saturated with... Um, how Marxism works, what's going on with Marxism, what cultural Marxism is doing, who's doing it, what are the talking points. And um, uh, and I just come off of releasing that movie. So I had it all in my head. And, you know, we interviewed former Communist Party leaders. We interviewed former KGB agents, people within the CIA, the FBI. And uh, so I was pretty well aware of what was going on. And then I get done with that. I want to take a break. I want to get back home to Iowa. I want to live a normal life for a while. And the first Sunday service after I get back home, I go to my Southern Baptist church in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And this pastor gets up and preaches a social justice sermon. Wow. And... Uh, I mean, every, every exploited scripture trying to justify it with Marxism. I mean, he went through the whole thing and my, I mean, let's say my spidey senses, everything was like going like red, you know, the bells dinging in my head going ding, 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 ding. And I wanted to get up and just shout him down from my seat, but I held my cool because my wife was looking at me like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Um, and I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. So I was like, how did this get into my local Iowa Southern Baptist Church? You know, where, where, where is this coming from? And I know after studying Marxism, um, these ideas originated somewhere. So I'm wondering, where did this guy get them from? Where did this preacher get these ideas from? And so I started doing some digging and started doing some research, contacted some of our uh, fellow researchers that helped with the previous film and uh, to my surprise, it was right out in the open and there was a, ma I saw a massive movement 
leading this way where people were re replacing the gospel of Jesus Christ and replacing it with a liberation theology laced social justice gospel. And, um, and I, and I started doing research. I put Trevor on research and, uh, we started finding actual leftist operatives that had infiltrated Christian organizations. And we started doing research on where they come from. And, um, one of the biggest things that I realized is that Christians were not prepped and ready for this fight. They're not prepped and ready to handle this because what Christians typically do is they will ask a theological question of going, Oh, well, this brother has good intentions. He just might be off a little the, you know, uh, off in his theology mm -hmm. and they give him so much grace, not really realizing that there's actually political activists pretending to be Christians to move the church further to the left. And I didn't see any pastors, any Christian theologians asking the political question of where did these people originate? And so I knew immediately right there, we had to do an expose and show people the root of this and where this was coming from. Wow. So would you say that that Sunday morning service was like your burning bush experience? It was, it was, it had definitely my burning bush experience and I went, um, and I said, look, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Here's my catalog of work. Here's stuff I've investigated. Here's my research. And he was quickly to throw it all aside, call me a conspiracy theorist and actually told me in our conversation that not everything Marx said was bad and that some of his ideas were good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Marx, uh, the biggest failure in the history of mankind. Every time his ideas have been implemented, they've resulted in death or damnation or pain and suffering. Yeah, that's, uh, I think we can honestly say that there's nothing that Marx ever proposed that was ever successful or valid. Able as far, you know, even my professional experience and well um, documented research, they didn't want to hear it. So did, I uh, presume you're not going to this church anymore, but did you notice a bunch of other local churches that were influenced in similar ways or was it just something that? So, well, so as, so as I started doing more research, I started digging into local churches in the area. Um, I found out, well, uh, they all tend to like the same theologians. They all tend to like the same, the, the same group of people and they would reference all the time and push their books. And it originated in the Gospel Coalition, uh, Tim Keller, right. and, uh, um, and people loosely affiliated with Sojourners. And then um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, within a year, all these churches started bringing John Perkins into town. So who's John Perkins? So John Perkins uh, is is head of what they call the uh, CCDA, the Christian Community Development Association. John Perkins was a longtime old school civil rights activist. Um, he was very active with the Communist Party uh, back in the late '60s and '70s. He was a he was a he was a radical, um, and then branded himself, uh, you know, as a you know as a Christian. Uh, uh, Christian guy looking for racial reconciliation, but the ironically the his main if he, if anybody could uh, sum up what he believes theologically is the three R's, which is uh, reconciliation, relocation, and redistribution. That's what Christians need to do with their lives. Explain for those okay. of us who don't know. Well, racial reconciliation, there's mm -hmm. obviously nothing wrong with racial reconciliation and people, you know, getting along with one another and, and putting aside differences and working together. Great thing. Relocation. Um, we're supposed to relocate uh, from where we're at in our comfortable lifestyles and go to the poor areas and uh, be representatives of the gospel. But then we need to redistribute our resources. I see. So mainly uh, whites redistributing to others. Exactly. Right. White, white, whites, whites redistributing to others. So like with any of this, like with any of the stuff, when you mix in the Marxism with theology, what you find is you find a half truth. 
you, you find a bit of a problem that maybe maybe a point of contention and tension, and we want to reconcile and uh, and fix that tension. But the solution is always Marxism. Mm-hmm. It's not reconciliation through Christ. It's reconciliation by you have to give up yours to us, and that's the only way you can reconcile. Right. And uh, so John Perkins, you know, uh, has really been making his rounds and getting into a lot of conservative uh, churches and areas and preaching this, and people are falling for it hook, line, and sinker. It doesn't matter the denomination. Really? Um, yeah. Well, I think. Do you I, find, what about, is it these churches? I'm, I, I'm not, are they mostly Caucasian? Yes. So, nope. yeah, so they'll get, you know, yeah, they go into a community, let's say it's a community like a place like Iowa, where Iowa is 90% Caucasian. And they will go into churches in the middle of Iowa and lecture them on not being diverse enough. <laughs> wow. So, so Judd, how do they get into these churches? Because, you know, we've been trying to spread the EBLM message into these churches and we, we have trouble getting traction, but these people seem to get in right. I mean, is it all the way from the top? How does it happen? Uh, they, they, uh, there's a lot of elements that are happening uh, that are contributing to this. You have one, lots of money being poured into leftist Christianity from secular organizations. Right. Yep. One of the ones we need to clearly point out in, in, in the film is, as we found Soros, funding evangelical organizations yep. we found uh we find large um uh large foundations uh nonprofits um that of all they're all contributing to to this education point well then well how do these guys go for just you know let's say getting into method from methodist churches or uh you know let's say mainline denominations how do they get into baptists how do they get into these other conservative denominations well, these guys were ushered in to these places right through the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. Okay. So you have the Gospel Coalition and these other organizations just paving the way and, uh, and starting to promote their books, starting to promote this literature throughout thousands of different churches across America. And then, well, if, if, if uh, so-and-so says this is a good person, well, I need to buy their book. I mean, this is kind of how it happened, but from funding from secular sources but also um i think some some people that i i believe were honestly uh people who infiltrated also helped pave the way for this to happen yeah i mean i think one of the things that i've noticed about pastors is that they they fail to realize that there is an evil agent working against the bible and christianity and they seem to think, oh, no, no, there's no, there's nothing working against the church. It's, you know, it, it's, it's like this naivety that people, pastors have, like, oh, no, that could never happen. The church could never be infiltrated. Have you had, have, have you had to have that conversation with pastors to make them wake up and look? I mean, because that's exactly what you're saying is, look, there is an organized movement against the church, but are pastors just refusing to accept that? I mean, it seems, because I mean, even right now with the whole vaccine mandate and the, the, the whole similarities to the to you know the the future the foretelling and in, in the revelation pastors are still no 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 you no you're just it's just a conspiracy there's no similarity there i mean how have you noticed that and what have you what have you found works best to break them of that ignorance if you will or that disbelief overwhelm them with evidence which is why we had to make the movie mm. I, that i mean seriously because there's a lot of people that have been there, not a lot. There have only been a few people raising awareness on this thing over the past mm-hmm. four or five years, mm-hmm. but it's in this little corner over here, this little corner over here, you have to go searching for it to try to compile everything. And that's why I see the need for a do- saw the need for a documentary because it takes everything and puts it in one place right. for people to digest over, over two hours and to say, and, and we just go. This is this. This is what happened here. Here's some his- history of why this happened here. This person's doing it. This person's doing it. This person's doing it. This is how. And so the documentary is able to just put the, you know, puzzle together for people because one little article that comes out here one week and maybe four months later, another article comes out here. No one's quite paying attention or following it. But we've got the feedback we've gotten from people is that the we have put 
the and this isn't it's a it's an analogy in the movie we put the puzzle pieces together for people to actually see it for what it is and then all of a sudden we've getting feedback from people saying wow this all makes sense this all makes sense because it's all been put together for us and we saw this then we felt uncomfortable oh we saw this a year later we didn't quite understand this we saw this this time we didn't quite make sense of it but now we've kind of shown the origins and who's doing it and and why it's there um and for pastors they have been taught in seminary from the very get-go as soon as they step foot in the seminary don't talk about politics from your pulpit yep don't talk about politics from your pulpit that's something you don't want to avoid it'll cause division it, it's not the gospel blah 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 neil you're an expert in this subject <laughs> and, <laughs> um but but it's but uh we we explain that in the film it's the heresy of pietism right it's the heresy of pietism in 90 percent of churches are plagued with pietism and so pastors from seminary were not taught they weren't taught in high school they probably even weren't taught by their parents you have to pay attention to the politics you have to be aware of what's going on in the world around you and that's why uh the church has been ill-equipped to handle the situation and that's why it's been it's been infiltrated so easily don't jut off you know the things that Oh, sorry, real quick, Ronnie, that was, but I just want to uh, segue on, uh, you know, just one of the things that I appreciate so much about the movie is that, you know, upon watching it, I was at the uh, the premiere uh, because I had a little little cameo in there. But one of the things that I appreciate so much was the ability for, for you all to connect the dots um, from the seminaries to the major uh, figureheads and speakers to the major funders, the Soros and the likes, uh, and then the figureheads, of course, the the, the Pipers, the Beth Moores, the, uh, and all of these other figures, to the major seminaries, uh, you know, Southern Baptist and all the other, um, and you put it all together with facts that connects the dots all the way up and all the way down mm -hmm. to where it makes sense. People could see, oh my gosh, we've been fully infiltrated. And and then you could see why people, why these pastors speak the way they speak, preach the way they preach, and are preaching a particular vein or a particular type of message. Um, and why, and, and, and you know, and, 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 and that kind of thing. Because, you know, when you think about it, logically, it's like, why are they going down that? Why are they preaching this way? Why are they doing this? Veering so far from the gospel, it doesn't make sense when the gospel is, is more than sufficient. Why are you going social justice? Why are you going CRT? Why are you going liberation theology when the gospel is good enough until you, you know, you, you put it together with the way that you guys have done in this movie. So it makes sense. So that's why I appreciate it. Sorry, Lonnie. Well, I just oh, want no, to point out no, that great point. I want real, real, real quick. I wanted to point out, I want to point out something for uh, uh, Kevin. Um, we had to have you in the film because you're the most handsome guy in it. It really helps. <laughs> <laughs> you needed a mug shot in there so you said look let's get that mug in there that, that breaks up the monotony of it. i i hadn't met kevin and we were we were setting up for interviews and i run into kevin in the hallway and i was like this is a handsome looking fella yeah, right. and then we started talking i was like hey you want to come in for an interview and it, it worked out perfect i was like i love this guy yeah. uh, so, thank god thank god our paths crossed no. There you go. You saved the movie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Judge, you touched on something near and dear to me and that um, I deal with pastors on a regular basis and have done so since uh, arriving in D.C. Uh, uh, well, almost 10 years ago. Uh, but my frustration level had always been uh, their a typical response is, well, Brother Lonnie, you, you see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not all about politics. I'm just about the gospel of Jesus, and which shows us a huge chasm or disconnect between them understanding that Jesus was very political. And so me not being a pastor, but being bold enough to speak to them in out of love and would just remind them of um, being political is what cost Jesus his life. Thank God it did because of us but it was a very political environment for both him and his first cousin, John. And so I've gotten some to be able to 
swing around and I'm getting phone calls, you know, where and I want to repent and apologize to you, Lonnie. I hadn't thought about it because I'm meeting pastors or I had met pastors in the past who are preaching the gospel. I mean, these are good men of God, but hadn't voted in 30 years. 30 years. Of, how can you be a pastor and not vote? Because they see that separation, which you say they were taught in seminaries, reinforced with organizations that they're a part of. And so a movie like this goes a long way in helping me and, and Neil and Kevin and uh, Regina with giving us the tools that we need to be able to sway them, to get them to at least pause and ponder that position that they're taking. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I see is that we hear from pastors, look, I, I you know, I'm, I'm staying away from politics. And then we remind and we say, but wait a minute, weren't you, when BLM was just writing last year, weren't you, weren't you out there? Or didn't you have people out there? Didn't you encourage them? To... Well, yeah, well, wait a minute, Pat, that, that was a political activity. Yeah. How are, you, how are you telling me that you, you stay out of politics? That was politics. Hmm. Oh, oh. Yeah, Doc, that was politics. What are you talking about? You don't, you you stay out of politics. Are you kidding me? You 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 don't want to have anything to do with EBLM, but you you encourage your people to get out there and go and act crazy in the street with BLM. Are you kidding yeah. me? I mean, yeah. what what's the matter here? Something's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? It's it it is it it, it is a tragedy uh, watching this happen, and I've seen it happen in. You know, in, in, in my old community where uh, quote unquote conservative pastors went out and marched with BLM. Yeah. And I'm going and, and, and I'm going, OK, so right next to you, you're marching for justice and you're marching for all this stuff. And yet you're you're marching with gals wearing the, uh, you know, um, abortion hats on uh, yeah. marching with the LGBTQ people right next to you uh, calling for justice. Um, and. That was the thing with this pastor, particular pastor, he gave a pro BLM thing in that same social justice speech. And I said, do you know what BLM is? Because I knew what BLM was before a lot of people because of Trevor, you know, uh, looking out. It's like, you know, they, they're they're a front from the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. It's run by a lesbian. Uh, uh, um, I want to say witch, um, if you will, but she practices the uh, the occult witchcraft religion from Nigeria. Yeah. Um, and he's, he, and he thought he, he didn't believe me. He wouldn't believe me when I said, this is what it is. And I sent him, I actually took the time to send him evidence and wouldn't look at it. Um, but the whole, you know, the whole thing is, is that, uh, when it comes to politics and pastors, I think a lot of them use it as a crutch to not, to not, uh, be involved in popular things. I think pietism and to not be involved in politics, I think. Um, and I'll say this pretty bluntly, a lot of pastors shouldn't be pastors in their hirelings. Mm -hmm. And they use, we don't get involved in politics as a crutch to play neutral because right. they actually aren't shepherds. They're just hirelings trying to get a paycheck from a church. Right. And I think that's the other thing we're dealing with too. But when yeah. the, when, when 90% of society comes out and says, oh, you need to march with BLM because that's what everyone else is doing. That's why you see those pastors marching with BLM. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's how the children of Israel got the golden calf, though, right? Because thank you. Aaron, the, the people were like, uh, make us a god. And Aaron's like, yeah, okay, no problem. It's like, when, uh, yeah. hello. <laughs> Moses, Where did you just come from? Right. And then when Moses asked him, why did you do that? He goes, oh, the people wanted it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's leadership? Yeah. No. <laughs> that's not so, shepherding. Yeah. So, Judd, I have a question about so, what is some of the biggest criticisms you've been getting? And how are you countering that? I mean, do you have like a FAQ somewhere? I mean, because I know eventually we'll get people attacking certain aspects of this. And then okay, so, a... uh, so we just put up our uh, Wokipedia uh, oh. page. <laughs> well, like, so it's enemies within the church slash Wokipedia. Wokipedia. Um, so, so we have, we're profiling woke evangelicals. And uh, we started off with the people that are in our movie. And, um, and we're, we're, it's been a long process, but over the next month, you're going to see that thing really populated with not just people in the film, but a lot of other folks and organizations. Give us um, some of those big names right off top real quick. The Gospel Coalition, Tim Keller, Al Mohler, which is a big surprise, and that's a, that it'll segue into the question. I just, I just want to go on the Al Mohler thing real quick. So, um, and I'll drop names because I don't care, 
uh, yeah. the uh, uh, Salem, Salem Media, Salem really Salem Salem Network uh, contacted us uh, when the movie was before we released the movie, and they wanted to release the <laughs> movie, right? And uh, um, and I so we started doing some negotiations. They wanted to release it on Salem, and I said, um, you know, started working out a contract, and then all of a sudden um, they paused and they said we need another screener of your movie. I said, okay, the CEO wanted to see it. And I sent him the copy, a spe special copy so he could watch it on his private plane. And I get a call back the next week saying, well, we can't show your movie. And wow. by the way, did you Matthew 18 Al Mohler? Did you bother to Matthew 18 Al Mohler? And I was like, well, if you watch the film, um, people in the movie did confront Al Mohler. And a lot of people confronted Al Mohler multiple times, asking him why he continues to hire woke social justice professors at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. Why did he hire and promote Russell Moore throughout the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the Trojan horse of the Southern Baptist Convention, as far as I'm concerned, with bringing in right. uh, leftism and, you know, and all, all these other things. And I was like, plenty of people have confronted him and Al Mohler's lied to their faces. Well, then they said that we can't pull the movie because you talk bad about Al Mohler. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten this from, uh, the, the, that's not the only, only organization. A lot of people are like going, well, you know, you can't really say this because I just want to get this off my chest and I'll just say this now. This is what's shocking is you have to quit looking at what people say and watch what people do. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'll just say this right now. If anybody an evangelical leader, a pastor, a politician speaks with ambiguity. <laughs> if they speak with ambiguity and they are not concise and clear on where they stand, yeah. they are a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is one of the mm -hmm. telltale signs that you should be looking at when you're listening to a theologian. So they'll put word salads out. So what what a, what a person who speaks in ambiguity does, and this is this is what they specialize in, they can speak in general terms and a person can easily project themselves onto said person, meaning they will think that person who's a good communicator speaks in ambiguity represents their interests, but they are not clear and concise on who they are and what they represent. Okay, this is how political chameleons have gained power in many of these organizations and that Al Mohler is one of them. Tim Keller is also Mr. Gift of amb Ambiguity, but have always been punching right and pushing left their entire careers. Yeah. Mm. And people have to get beyond the word salads and look at the actions. What are yeah. the fruits of their ministries and what have they done? Exactly. exactly. And so I'm sorry, I wanted to get that off my chest. I know it's going to be controversial, but there are, there are many people and many organizations that lay cover for these guys because of conferences, big book deals, you name it. There's an industry that is protecting the the wolves and the enemies within. Right. And so the difference between us and every other group, I guess, is we came out, we named the names unapologetically and said, oh, here it is. We're just dropping the bomb and saying, guys, this is what this is what's going on. We don't care about conferences, book deals and getting, you know, getting the next uh, big promotion. That's not what we're here for. We're here to actually do something and change something. Yeah. So um, anyway, sorry to go on that tangent, but I but that's one of the biggest things that pe that surprisingly people who should know better have come to us laying still laying cover for these enemies within the church protecting what I don't know. Hmm. They're yeah, called we, enemies within the church for a reason. We can say the Democrats <laughs> are bad all day long, and that right. the, but the people that are enabling it and pushing it in our own circles are the ones that need to be held accountable. Exactly. They're more dangerous than the Democrats outside our gates. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Wow. All right. What are the big names you have? Oh man. Um, well, one of the here's here's the interesting thing. Uh, one of the guys that I wish we would spend more time on in the film, um, but this guy has his hands in everything, and also has his hands tied into a lot of other big evangelical organizations, and that's Michael Ware. Michael Ware was Obama's faith advisor and worked oh. in the Obama administration. 
uh, and what what I've learned that after the fact and after the film is that this is a guy you have to watch because this is a guy that um, uh, recruits people in evangelical circles and and gets them uh, grant money. And you see a lot of the major shifts and and the things that have happened within conservative evangelical circles, you see a Michael Ware attached from the Obama administration. So this guy created the what they call the AND campaign. Uh, which is the campaign for uh, social justice and blending theology and social justice together. It's a new hip thing. Um, they got a lot of money behind it. But the guy that partnered with him in the AND campaign was the president of the Southern Baptist SEN Network, which was the head of the uh, Southern Baptist uh, North American Church Planning Organization. Mm-hmm. So you had the president of of all of church planning in North America for the Southern Baptists partnered with Michael Ware to create the AND campaign for social justice. And one of the things we found is, so there's a partnership with Michael Ware, Dottie Lewis is his name from uh, the SEN network. And what we found out is, is that if you wanted to be a church planner within the Southern Baptist convention, you didn't get funding if you weren't woke. Ah. Uh-huh. If you weren't part of the social justice agenda and part of what they were doing, your new church plant did not get funding. Now, ever since our film came out, Dottie Lewis uh, is no longer with the SEN network, but they've moved him to another position and the Southern Baptists are still giving him money. Hmm. But you see Michael Ware directly tied in with Russell Moore. You see Michael Ware tied in with a lot of these other groups. And now uh, Michael Ware has a direct connection with, um, uh, the Oikonomia Network. Have you heard of them? No. Okay. Uh, help help uh, was help created by Tim Keller and a guy by the name of Greg Forster. Um, they have grant programs in over 40 conservative seminaries. And Michael Ware is now attached to that organization. So you have a big grant network, Oikonomia Network, the Kern Family Foundation, pumping in these programs into Christian seminaries that are look good at the surface, but underneath is full of social justice. Mm -hmm. So seminaries taking money from Kern and implementing the Oikonomia uh, language are Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, um, Azusa Pacific, uh, Indiana Wesleyan University. I could go on and on and on. And these are major, what people thought were safe institutions that are now taking money from a left from an organization that is pumping your kids full of social justice at a Christian school. So, uh, wow. what, so, so the bottom line is, and uh, we don't want to take up too much time or spill all of the goods. We want to, sorry, sorry. We want to <laughs> compel our partners that this is a movie well worth seeing. It's a documentary that documents facts, that connects the dots. Uh, most people in our partner network understand that um, that Neil and I uh, are going across the country and talking about critical race theory and liberation theology, black liberation theology, and we're doing our thing. But we, um, and so they understand that, and they understand that Soros is a threat, but they haven't really, um, connected the dots within the church in particular. Mm -hmm. And so we want them to understand that there is a direct threat within the body of Christ that is happening today. And this documentary really cements that. It brings, uh, uh, it really, you know, sort of culminates uh, the story. And so we want our partners to take part in, um, in this next level of education. So they become um, uh, more wise about what's really going on uh, around us because um, the church is under attack and we do have enemies within the church. Uh, uh, unfortunately, some of the enemies within the church are at the very top. Um, people that we have known and respected, uh, people we've respected as theologians, um, you know, people that we've respected as as authors and, and, and educators, 
um, mm -hmm. people that we respected as, as, as deans of major uh, seminaries, uh, uh, you know, major denominations, um, they're, they've been infiltrated and, and, um, and unfortunately uh, they, they're taking money from some of the evilest people on the planet. Um, and, and that's where we are. And yep. so um, we need to understand what's really happening because instead of uh, us continuing to sacrifice our children, our progeny, our grandchildren, and sing, sending them to uh, these colleges or these seminaries that have already been significantly infiltrated by demonism, um, let's at least, if we're gonna do any of that kind of stuff, let's at least go in with our eyes wide open and help prepare our children and help prepare our, you know, our, our, ourselves for understanding what's really happening within the communities that we are going to participate in. Mm -hmm. So that's what this exercise is about. Um, oh, I, I want to, I, I want to add, I just want to add, yeah. add a couple of things in here, uh, names and organizations to look at, um, look, yeah, at campus, look at Campus Crusade. That was the one, Campus Crusade was the one that hit me mm. really hard. Yeah. Like I was like, what I what I couldn't believe is like they were so blatant. They were worse than some of the seminaries we witnessed, where they dedicated five years of their conferences to critical race theory and social justice, and brought in uh, leftist activist speakers who weren't even Christian into speaking to their staff members. Oh. And no, then, you mean crew or campus crew, 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 campus crusade crew. Yeah, was was watching watching that whole thing unravel, and then. Uh, and someone and, and people ask, well, Campus Crusade, you know, they're how could they ever do this? And, you know, you're just lying. You're making stuff up. Um, I'm just going to share this right now is um, me and another gentleman met, went and met with uh, head leadership of crew, went, went and flew out to Atlanta just for, to have a meeting with them. And so I could talk to him face to face. And um, they refused that. Well, they they they. They admitted that they went a little bit too far, but they wouldn't acknowledge and say they made a mistake. And instead of, and I said, why don't you guys come out and say you made a mistake and just say, we're done with this. We're going to get back to Bill Bright's vision. We're going to get back to sharing the gospel, the, the, the what Campus Crusade was built on. And uh, they refused to do it. And instead, instead of uh, uh, confronting it and, and, uh, um, and doing something about it, they pushed it under the rug, still hire the same people and are still requiring staffers to go through um, uh, training and essentially where they're indoctrinated into Marxism. Well, wow. and um, so when, when people say, and then, you know, we, we, You're lost. Uh -oh. John, yes, we lost you. Judge. It's so funny that we say that when they can't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> As if that helps us feel better, you know? Like. Uh oh. Judd. <laughs> He's frozen. You got frozen there, man. He might be able to hear us. Sometimes the outgoing doesn't work, but end up. We can cut this out, hopefully. <laughs> Sure, I'll put some dancing dogs and you know, <laughs> little cats. Distract He's call, people. He's calling back in. Here we go. Hello. Okay, we, we lost some of that. So let's go right. back to. Um, I think the part that we lost you at was you went to meet with Campus Crusade. Okay, and they, and they wouldn't refused stop to acknowledge training. that they refused to acknowledge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So so they refused to acknowledge Campus Crusade crew. Uh, refused to acknowledge that they really made a mistake. Uh, and I asked him, I, and I, I looked at him point blank and I said, guys, I said, whose bright idea was it mm -hmm. to have your last five conferences dedicated to social justice, to Marxism and having Christians hold hands and lament of their white privilege. Mm. I said, whose bright idea was it? And I said, and why didn't one of you look at this and say, this is insane. We need to stop this. And they just looked at me and didn't say a word. Mm. And they said that they would, they said they would, 
they would correct course, but all they did was they 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 scrubbed their website, they 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 pushed it under the rug. They're still hiring the same people, and they're still requiring their staff to go through um, social justice training. So, you know, I don't I don't know what to say. You know, we we confronted them. I confronted them face to face over this. I showed them videos. I said, "You guys did this." Oh, by the way, do you realize that you're hiring a Marxist organization to hire to, to teach your staff that aren't even Christian? It's called the uh, it's called the Freedom Road. They're hiring a group called the Freedom Road to teach their staffers on diversity. Mm. Wow, true. Yeah, and, and and I think what this tells you is okay. that they're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in being corrected. So that somebody there has an agenda, and then they're they're going through the agenda because otherwise they would go. Oh my goodness! Wow, um, and I think if they realize that the person with the agenda doesn't care if crew dies, and so maybe the agenda is two things: one, that crew dies, and two, that in its dying throes, it converts or convinces a bunch of people to go this route. Right, right. The there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's no other explanation, and um, that's the thing. I think a lot of people don't realize that what they are funding today. They think they're funding good Christian organizations, but it's not good Christian organization like they were 20 years ago. Yeah. They've been taken over and hijacked. The right. men and women of God that fought through adversity to build these organizations that stood for truth have passed away, and they've left it to another generation that's selling it out. Uh -huh. That is what I'm seeing all, I mean, that's seminaries, that's denominations, that's parachurch organizations. The men and women of God that stood for courage and built them are being destroyed by either their kids or the people they left it to. And worse, I think there are some really good missionaries out there that are on staff at Crew who are going to yes. suffer the consequences. Really yes. good people are going to, because I stopped giving to Crew, and but I agreed, I believe in the in the mission of the missionaries that I was funding. Yes, I, there, I had no intention of letting Crew get any of that money. Yeah, there, there, there are still people um, that are that are good people that are with crew that are are really trying to figure out what they're going to do and uh they're put between a rock and a hard place um oh. but but we have here's the thing i've had a lot of people within crew send me videos they sent me stuff they sent me all the documentation of what's going on in there but for one reason or another they were afraid to come out on camera well yeah it would jeopardize their entire ministry uh i met one 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 couple that left crew and because they left crew their donors couldn't get it through their mind what was going on and they quit supporting those missionaries mm. that, I mean, so it's it, it's hard for some of these people and i get it but you know for every person that you saw in our film there's a hundred people that would talk to us in private that were afraid to come out on camera so wow. so, so judd i think what you're saying is that there is a a huge opportunity for an alternative missionary organization to acquire these missionaries, yes, provided the same level of support, and yes. get those donors transferred over without yes. the compromise. Yes, so maybe One, this is a clarion call to people out there who already have an organization that can support people out there. Right, crew cannot be saved, but I'll tell you what: an authentic group of people that love Jesus and actually care about the scriptures and want to spread the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Two of them will make a lot more difference in the world than a thousand fakes at crew. If the real people came out and got together and it was a blessed ministry by God, it would have a major impact instead of the counterfeit that crew has become. So I know we're going to run out of time here. So Judd, what can people do? Can they show your movie at their church? What does it take? Do they charge an admission fee? How do they get the word we, out? And, we, and we, have, uh, we, we have a group rate purchase thing available on our website. So if they want to show it to a large group, we have a licensing fee. We, we can do that on the website. Uh, they can purchase the DVD uh, uh, you know, through our website. By the way, because you guys are so awesome, we created a discount code for uh, EBLM. So if you go to our website and you buy a DVD, buy anything on the store, you type in the code EBLM at checkout, get 20% off. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Judd, do you have a way to, to stream it, pay and stream it? Uh, we, the networks? Yeah, they can they can stream it through our website. I don't have the ability to do discount on the stream through That's the fine. website, but we have discount available for the DVD. Okay. Um, I'm trying to work on a discount for the stream. And um, if it does come up, it'll be called Handsome Kevin. 
<laughs> wow, look at that. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> Devin, uh, I, I see you at the Dove Awards or something like that. I mean, it's just, <laughs> there we go. Maybe so, there's, uh, a, maybe there's got, a movie career, a movie yeah, actor career right. here, Kevin. Oh, please. We won't be able to deal with him, Judd. Please stop. Uh, no, I go, well, please. You have created, a, you've like given the five-year-old candy at night and you're leaving. Yeah, like, <laughs> handsome Lonnie, maybe. Handsome Kevin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and the website. Judd, I, Oh, yeah. I do website, have a um... the website. Okay, our website is www.enemieswithinthechurch.com, all one word, enemieswithinthechurch.com. Uh, you can uh, look us up on there, and then from there you can go to our Wikipedia, see extended interviews, and then if you know of a woke pastor, woke professor, woke seminary, you got some information, contact us on our website and submit that information, and our team will put it together research it and then if it's legit we'll put it up on our wikipedia site and uh um there's a lot of other ideas and things that we're looking at doing uh to create more resources for people uh to use to help fight this war but uh the way i see it is we're all in this together we're all in this fight and if we don't steer uh bring the church back in the right direction in america it we're gonna lose we're gonna lose our country and the only thing that can save this country is is God and and the church and Christians rising up. Um, you, you had something? Yeah, I you know I was gonna play a little devil's advocate here and just say, okay, so you know, black female Keisha got my husband Mark. We got some kids. Why should we care? Why, why should, should we? Why should we? I mean, we're working our jobs, we're, you know, going to our church, which is not in any of those organizations that you've mentioned. Why should I care, though? You should care because if the church goes, so does the rest of the nation. Yeah. Every Christian has a, has a duty to fight this movement and to stand up for truth and to speak out publicly against the lies that are contradicting the real gospel that are contradicting uh the very founding of this nation it doesn't matter where you are what place of life you're in you have a circle of influence and i suggest everybody use it to have those conversations anywhere they have influence in so we can turn this thing around well i mean there, and there's also two other good reasons one even if even if you're not a christian the very fact that every time communism and socialism has been tried has it has failed and resulted in a powerful class with the underclass that of subservient peasants, right, if you will. So uh, the very fact that America is being infiltrated in the strongest institution within America, which is the church, which has maintained the family, which is, as we know, most critical to any African-American uh, community is their family, their fathers, their mothers, and the state replacing that will result in pain and suffering for everybody, especially the lower classes. I mean, yeah, if you are one of the elite, you don't have to worry about Marxism, because you'll probably be in the top ruling class. But if you're one of the schmucks at the bottom, guess what? You're going to be the one suffering and your kids are going to suffer. So I think that's a, a lot of um... y'all are going to go to the same prison we go to. Right. <laughs> yeah, let's, exactly. let's 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 try. Let's try to avoid it. Yep. You said there were two points. Did you say your other point, Neil? Uh, yeah, no, those are the two points. One is okay. that you you are it's going to break down the church and break down society. Okay. Too you're going to be in the bottom rung of the society. You're not going to be one of the privileged class, whatever you think. I mean, this is the argument I have with most of my black friends who are liberal. I say, look, when has the government ever really helped you? In the long term, the minority is going to suffer if the government is more powerful. You're mm -hmm. not going to be the more powerful of the, of the you know, you're not going to be in power. So you, you don't want the government to be more powerful. Yeah. Um, one last thing, uh, I want to encourage <clears throat> all of our partners to mm. take advantage of the special offer for enemies. Mm -hmm. Get the DVD, share it with friends and family at your house, and mm. uh, spread this word. It's an important documentary. You have to see it. Uh, you have to, you know, really educate yourself and your family and friends about what's going on <clears throat> within the church. Uh, number two. Um, uh, we at EBLM take this this threat very very seriously. 
uh, uh, Lonnie is, is, is taking it up on himself to um, try to come up with some sort of certification. We, we want to be able to, you know, work with churches and, and come up with a way that we could, we at EBLM could certify uh, that you're, you were, you're, that you as a church are standing against, publicly standing against wokeism. We don't know how that's going to look yet. Lonnie's working on it. Um, but you know, it's it's a, it's basically a church making a proclamation. You know, we're not woke, and and that's that's what's going to separate uh, that particular uh, assembly from from others. And so you'll know very clearly walking in. Hey, this is not a church that's playing around with the culture and playing around playing tiddlywinks with this gospel and that gospel and these other religions be it social justice or or liberation theology and that we're you know this church is square on the gospel and the gospel is good enough Amen. and so we're, we're we're going to be working uh to come up with something that that churches can make that proclamation that declaration so everybody that comes through that door knows we're serious the gospel is good enough it's more than sufficient Jesus, what he did on the cross is good enough. We don't need to add, subtract, or do anything different. It's good enough. And so Lonnie's uh, working on that, and we'll be coming up with that probably sometime uh, this year. So anyway, um, for us, we're, we're serious about this thing. Uh, for Judd and Pastor Kerry and the rest of the team, they're serious about it. And, and I'll be working with Judd and the team as well uh, this year. We'll be going across the country together. Um, with various, I guess, seminars and, and things. And we'll be talking about this even more uh, as, as time permits, we'll be doing that as well. So Amen. Um, anyway, we, we just want to thank you, uh, Judd. And uh, yes, please follow us with thank me. You. 